This morning we take a little different direction in our study of the names of God. We're moving from just a, uh, an introduction to God, which is what we've done for the last four weeks, to now beginning to go a little deeper in a sense that we want to really unwrap who this God is. Uh, we're going to continue to look at the names and try to really dig in on those names, but really trying to discern what, what the application is. I have this just strong passion in my life, and, and unfortunately, it's something that I've had to battle all my life because I do the same thing, that information and without application that leads to transformation, in my mind, is absolutely worthless. And so I always want to take us to kind of that question of so what when we look at the names of God. Uh, for the last two weeks, we've been looking at the names of God and, and really using the analogy of a diamond. I've got a picture of a diamond here to put on the screen. I want you to see this. When we look at diamonds, uh, they're absolutely amazing. They're beautiful. And when I think about diamonds, they represent a lot of things. There's a lot of color there. There's a lot of different nuances. And it depends on where you look at the diamond, you see something different. And it is the ultimate prism. The lights, the colors that come from diamonds are really, really amazing to look at. Don Wells actually kind of gave me that illustration a few weeks ago. He and I were talking one day after our senior adult luncheon. And, and he said, you know, isn't it kind of like that? And I, and I think he's spot on. And that's why we've used that. But really, uh, when we think about the names of God, I think that's as far as we can take the diamond analogy. And what I mean by that is a diamond is something that you appreciate. It's certainly valuable, but it really has no power to transform your life except when you first get one, ladies, and you go, oh, you know. And beyond that, it sort of loses any real impact uh, in your life. You may look at it throughout the years, and it may bring some some uh, warm and fond memories or, or whatever. You may go to the store and tell your husband he's a loser if he doesn't buy you another one. But, but it just really doesn't have great impact. But as we take God's name and we continue to unwrap it, we continue to just sort of pull it apart with this little direction we're going to do, uh, we're going to take today. It really has the ability uh, to really make great, great impact in our lives. <coughs> Excuse me, I don't know how I'm going to get past this. I took some uh, cough syrup this morning, and as I was starting to leave the house, I noticed it had codeine, so this could be fun today, all right? So uh, here we go. I don't think I'm going to sleep. I just may say all that stuff that I think that I do keep from saying normally here, here right? Last Christmas, we had a, a gift throughout the, the December uh, month on the platform, and then when we came back on Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, actually, we opened up that gift. And we talked about how that we need to unwrap those presents. I mean, people give you gifts, but if you don't open them up and make them your own uh, in a personal way, then they have no real impact in your life. And that's true with God. Um, <clears throat> we can have knowledge of God. We can have an experience with God. But if we're not daily really digging into his purpose and his plan and allowing him to work in us, then it's... He's kind of even lost his opportunity to add value to our lives. And I don't mean to add, add to, to in, in imply, um, and maybe this is the coding talking a little bit, that, that you know, God, certainly God is sovereign and God is working even when we don't see it, even when we don't sense it, and he's beyond what we do. We don't control God in any way. But we do limit God working in us as we resist the Holy Spirit, as we resist his plan. Again, God is like a diamond in so many ways, but it does break down when you think about how that God has so much more that he wants to reveal to us, and it's really an unlimited resource in our lives. That's really the application, at least for me. Let me give you a couple things to jot down very quickly. First of all, there, there are certain benefits and privileges that come with the names of God when we unwrap them. Now that sounds, I, I wrestled with that statement a little bit because that sounds so much like modern Christianity. That sounds so much like evangelical worldly Christianity. I, I recognize that. But let me walk you through that statement. There are certain benefits and privileges that come with the names of God when we unwrap them. I use those <coughs> not in a sense of... Uh, you know, not in the sense of that God is this celestial uh, giver of everything that I want because I'm a spoiled child kind of God in the sky. But the reality is, is that a relationship with God does bring benefits. It does bring privileges that you cannot have apart from a true relationship with the creator of the universe. 
And so you are limited to your flesh. You're limited to your ability. But when we are born in Christ, when we experience that redemption, that reconciliation in Christ Jesus, we then are joint heirs with Jesus and we have the fullness of the Godhead. Listen. Think about that. The fullness of the Godhead available to us, not in a selfish way, but as it impacts and applies to kingdom purposes. And so many Christians today, their view of God is I go to church when my schedule allows and I sing a few songs and I get bored to death by the pastor and I go home and that's all they know of God. And we've lost any sense of the true powerful living God of the Bible. And unfortunately, that's what's modeled before us. Think about this. There is bad news. I don't want to give you a lot of bad news today, but this will be on the screen as well. The bad news today is life has problems. How many of you already knew that, right? Okay, good. The good news today is that God has a name for them. That's what the names of God really are about, as I understand it. It is God revealing his character so that he knows, that we know, he is absolutely sovereign over all things. And through his character, and that character being applied in our personal lives daily, God radically can change every circumstance, every environment that we're a part of. God has a name for them. Whatever you're facing, there is a name for God that is applicable for it. Think about that in your personal life. Uh, Psalm uh, Psalm 59, verse 5. I I want us to launch into this this morning by looking at this verse. You, O Lord, that's the name Yahweh, that personal, self-existent God. We talked about that. That was the second uh, series in this teaching. You, O Lord, Yahweh, God, that's Elohim. That's the first name of God in the Bible. That's that creator, that all-powerful God. And then the third one is God of host. That's actually pronounced Savah. Now let me, let me help you with that. Just Well, we'll get to it in a moment. The God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Do not be gracious to any who are treacherous in iniquity. That's not a prayer that I want to pray personally, to be honest with you. Because I want God to be gracious to everybody. And, and you say, well, why do you feel that way? Well, if he starts not being gracious to some, I'm a little concerned about which list I may be on. So I want God to be gracious to everyone, right? I I just struggle with that. I've I've been honest with you. I've I've felt that way all my life. You know, I I have trouble being too condemning on people because I I recognize that it's by grace that I function in this life anyway. But look at those incredible words. Awake to punish all the nations. This is the kind of God we're talking about. So the name today, (coughs) I hope that's not bothering you as much as it's bothering me. Can you deal with it? All right, good. This is your excuse to get up and walk out. All right, here we go. So the name we're looking at today is Yahweh Savah. Yahweh Savah. Look at it on the screen. I know it doesn't look like that. It's got a T, but the T is silent. And the Ba in the original language is pronounced more like a V, Va. So it's Savah, if you want to pronounce that correctly. Yahweh Savah. You will see it sometimes as Jehovah. Remember that about fourth generation interpretation of the word Yahweh. From the Tetragrammaton all the way down. Remember we talked through that. But Yahweh Savah. Savah can be used either as a verb or as a noun. You might want to just jot this down because this is really, really important as you understand Scripture and understand what God wants to bring to your life. If it's in the form of the verb, it means to wage war. It means mighty warrior or warrior or battle bringing or battle engaging. (coughs) If it's used in the sense of a noun, it means armies or as we saw it here already translated, host. It's a multitude. It expresses myriads of groups of people or angels or armies or, or whatever the Bible might be referencing. Well, obviously, we're seeing it here used in in both the noun and the verb form. Listen to what Ann Graham Lotz wrote about this. I've looked at a thousand different things probably, and that's probably not an exaggeration to try to really capture what this is. And I I don't read a lot of Ann's stuff, but I found this that she wrote about the Yahweh Savah, and I thought it was so good. She said, the Lord, our warrior, she said, God will empower you to fight and win every single battle in this fallen world when you trust him. Pray for spiritual strength often. 
asking the Holy Spirit to work through you to be victorious in the battles you face. Courageous use, courageously use the authority you have as a Christian to fight and win the war between good and evil in every situation. So when I think about battles, when I think about God, the Lord of hosts, there is one passage of scripture that just jumped out so fast in my mind. The problem is it's a, a story that we know very well. And I think sometimes it is true that familiarity, well, maybe not brings contempt, but I think when we get real familiar with anything, we kind of take it for granted. And that's the story of David and Goliath. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let me encourage you to open up your copy of scriptures and turn there with me this morning, if you will. First Samuel chapter 17. Remember this morning we started out by praying and I, I challenged you to think about giants in your world. I challenged you to think about those things that you really work very hard not to think about. Sometimes those are internal whether it's an addiction, whether it's a, an image that we have of ourselves that's not healthy, that's certainly not of God. And then sometimes it's, it's external. It may be the job that we're facing. It may be a, a relationship that is very toxic, very unhealthy in your life. It can be a number of things. And I, I, I'm really hesitant to mention too many things because I don't want you to narrow it down to just something I said. It, it literally is can be any giant that you have in your life, any struggle that's going on that, that seems to uh, just really, it's just so large, it's just always looming there and it creates a great amount of angst and struggle in our lives, even fear from time to time, maybe fear every day of your life. And I don't know what that is for you. I, I know what my list of giants are. I know the struggles that I have with them. But when we think about the story of David and Goliath, everybody in this room probably knows that story. You either know it as the biblical account or you know it as a euphemism for something in life, whether it's a football team like uh, Texas Christian University that was facing the Goliath of Oklahoma, Boomer Sooner, by the way, uh, yesterday in a football game. That's college football. I know we don't get that here in Colorado, but it's just, it's, it's important to a lot of people in the world. Anyway... And, and what are you going to do for a coach? You don't know? You're going to get the guy they fired for losing too much? No? You don't think that's going to happen? Okay. All right. Good. I just had to check with our student pastor over here. He lost his football coach this weekend. So, so Goliath, let's think about him just for a moment. The whole David and Goliath thing, certainly he was a giant. Goliath was over nine feet tall, roughly closer to ten feet tall to be exact. Nine feet nine, the Bible tells us. And this was a man's man. I thought about having some of our tall guys in the church come stand up here, but I probably don't need to cough on them this morning, so I chose not to do that. Big guys, I don't want to make mad. And uh, I learned that lesson a long time ago. And uh, I was thinking about this, but just get it in your image. I mean, my son-in-law, which is not in here this morning, is 6'5". He's a tall dude, right? Think about nine feet nine. I mean, take a guy that's 6'5". Take a guy that's a seven-footer which we would consider a giant in our cultures today, right? Nine feet, nine inches tall. The Bible says that he had bronze arm armor that just the main part of the armor weighed about 125 pounds. So he starts out with 125 pounds being strapped on. He then takes, uh, uh, he's got the, the head of his spear, the scripture says, weighs 15 pounds, right? Chris, that's what you max out on in the gym, 15 pounds, right? That's you. 15 pounds just for the head of his spear. I mean, come on, folks, get this in your mind. Now, I know 15 pounds doesn't sound like a lot. Take a dumbbell of 15 pounds and see how long you can just hold it out like that. It gets heavy really, really fast. And not only that, he had a shield bearer that went out in front of him. Now, as it was in this culture, and has been in a lot of cultures throughout history, a lot of you folks who are military buffs, you know this, that for a long, long time, what armies would do, rather than seeing everybody slaughtered on the, battle, on the battlefield, they would <coughs> excuse me, pick a champion, and those champions would go out representing the various forces, and, and basically it was a winner-take-all conflict. 
And that's what was going on. Uh, Israelites were on one side of the hill, and, or one hill, and the Philistines were on the other side of the hill, and the valley of Elah was down in the middle. And by the way, those of us going to Israel, hopefully we'll get to see that valley this year. It's, it's a really cool place. And it's just really right there by Bethlehem. And, uh, and so they, they would shout to one another. Well, Goliath had been out there for 40 days and 40 nights. Now I think about that and I think about giants in my life and really 40 days and 40 nights, not a long time for some of the giants. I mean, some of the giants that I deal with, I've been dealing with 38, 39 years. Interesting enough, it coincides with how long I've been a pastor. And I really don't mean that to be humorous, it's true. There's some giants that I deal with all the time in ministry. They're just always there. And they really do intimidate me. And even after I've watched God and seen God's faithfulness and, and seen God's provision as Yahweh Jehirah, as we looked at a couple of weeks ago, I still struggle with these giants in my life. And they, they just seemingly never go away. Well, there's some things this morning I, I want us to pick up with. David was an amazing guy when you think about it. He, he had at least three full-time jobs, as I understand it in Scripture. He was certainly the, uh, I, I don't know, maybe it was a food truck kind of guy. I mean, he, he took food out to his brothers. I mean, there was cheese and grain and different things like that. I mean, that was part of David's job. But he was also a shepherd. And so he had really a full-time job back at home. And his, his father, Jesse, who had seven other brothers other than... Um, David sent David to check on his brothers who were part of that group that was on the hill listening to Goliath's taunts for 40 days and 40 nights. And, and so David does that. By the way, he was also the, the chief musician uh, for Saul. In fact, if you back up into chapter 16, just those few verses leading into 17, that's what he had just been doing. He had been just playing music for Saul to keep him calm. So this guy was working a lot of jobs, right? Very, very busy guy. And he comes up to check on his brothers. He's doing exactly what his father told him to do. He'd already delivered the goods. Everything was going well. And he heard Goliath taunting the armies of Israel. And David went off. And he lost his mind. And he said, well, what's going on here? What, what's going to be done to this Philistine who is taunting the armies of the living God? Now... Why did David have that approach to things? The scripture tells us in the story, and we're going to read it, hang on. The scripture tells us in the story that the, the armies of Israel were cowering back in fear of this giant Goliath. And I got to say to you, rightfully so, nine feet nine, obviously a brute. I, yeah, I think in reality, that's probably where most of us had been. Here's the key. David had already nailed down some of the names of God. David had not just looked at that diamond, but David had begun to embrace the power of that diamond which represented God in our analogy in this study. David had already embraced it and began to make application to his life. Let's pick it up in the 41st verse, all right? In the 41st verse. Very quickly. Then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy, that means red complexion, with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and to the beast of the field. Sounds like Baker Mayfield. I shouldn't have said that. You guys just are lost on that one. 45, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me. Oops, lost my place. You come to me with a sword and a spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. Wow. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all the assembly may know, listen to this, that the Lord does not deliver by sword or spear, for the battle is 
Yahweh Sava. And he will give you into our hands. Then it went and happened, the Philistine rose and came and draw near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into the bag and took it from the stone, and took a stone from it and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face uh, to the ground. Hey folks, listen to this. Satan has watched your game film. I mean, I mean, he's been planning, he scouts you. Now, not necessarily Satan himself. I, I really can't find a lot, of, a lot of proof in the Bible that Satan is really aware of any of us. I, I believe that's more of the jobs of the demon world, personally, as I understand Scripture. But I, I believe we've been scouted, and I believe at least they probably report back to Satan and tell, uh, tell him where our weak points are, and then he probably gives out orders for them to attack us at those weak points. Now, if you want Scripture to prove all that, I'm probably going to fall short a little bit, but I can give you general accounts where I believe that's the way it works. But stay with me on this. But he, he scouts us. He knows our weaknesses, and he knows the giants that take you out. He, he knows those things in your life that at best distract you and therefore keep you from doing the very reason that you're breathing, for doing those things that you are breathing to do today. He at least, at best, distracts you, if not fully takes you out and spiritually paralyzes you. That's because he studies your game film. There's a book on you. There's a book on all of us. And the enemy is very aware of what can make us absolutely paralyzed when it comes to God's plan and God's, God's purpose. And he often taunts us daily, night and day. You know those things that wear you out? Those things that frustrate you? Those things that you feel guilty over where you're always, you know, you know you should, but you can't. Listen, the enemy loves to taunt us on those things. And we will, we will never be perfect in the sense of meeting every mark every day. Our perfection comes through the righteousness of Christ. Our perfection will never come in our functionality every day in our lives. We will fail from time to time. But it doesn't have to be our regular M.O. It does not have to be the way we generally live every day of our lives. So I'm going to give you two things and then give you a couple of practical, practical things under those two things that I believe will help you as you deal with your giant in the power of Yahweh Sava. all right? Here's, here's number one. Change your perspective. Look at this on the screen. Change your perspective by unwrapping the power of God's name. Change your perspective by unwrapping the power of God's name. For those of you in the room that you know there's a point in time in your life that you can go back to, you can nail down where you were made that new creation that Ethan shared from the scripture this morning. You know that happened. You know that you came to know Christ. You know your sins were forgiven. And you know from that point on you were born again. You're going to spend eternity in heaven. Great. That's wonderful. You have this amazing gift. You know it's there. And you may even know what's in the gift. But folks, it's time to unwrap it. Amen. It's time to unwrap it and begin to live in the power of that gift, that incredible name of God. Now, let me give you just a couple of practical things. What, what does that look like? How do, I, how do I do that? What do you mean change your perspective? You know, David had a radically different perspective than the rest of the army of Israel, right? Now, I've said this before. You've heard this. This is not new. But David's perspective was more like this. Number one, listen, they were saying, the Israelites were saying he's too big to hit or too big to miss. How do you view the giant in your land, in your world? How did David view the giant? Well, David viewed him as he was too big to miss. How did the Israelites view him? He's too big to hit. I can't deal with this. I, I can't take this on. I can't overcome this. And you know what? You're probably exactly right. That's why you need to unwrap this incredible power of God's gift. 
That's why you need to begin to implement that which lives, dwells, is residing in you. You need to begin to walk in the power of God. And you would see miraculous things begin to happen in your life every day if we would unwrap the gift. I'm convinced the modern church has gifts everywhere. Do you understand that every one of you has at least one spiritual gift? I personally believe you have all of them because you have the Holy Spirit. But I, but I do believe I can stand firmly and say you have at least one spiritual gift. Are you using it for the kingdom of God? Some of you are miserable in life. Why? You're just going through the treadmill of life, doing what others expect you to do, hitting the marks that the culture demands that you hit. And yet there's something so empty, so wrong in your heart, and the giants seem to be overwhelming you and taking you out. Part of it's because you haven't unwrapped and implemented that gift in the kingdom of God. You're part of Riverside Church. Where are you serving currently at Riverside? You know that God never brings anybody to a body of believers to sit and soak? It's not a hot tub. God brings people together and blends those gifts together for the mighty, powerful purpose of the kingdom of God. God never intended for you just to show up every Sunday and take. God intended for you to be engaged with your spiritual gift, giving to the ministry that God has connected you with. Change your perspective. Number two. David had a perspective that included the spiritual realm. David had a perspective that included the spiritual realm. Today, we don't see with spiritual eyes very often. I think way too many of us are just focused on the secular. We're focused on the flesh. We're focused on those, again, those cultural things that have been pressed on us. And we don't see with spiritual eyes. Look at verse 45. Uh, as David uh, stated this, he said, Then David said to them, to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. You see the difference? David countered Goliath's mockery by announcing that he had the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Savah, on his side. Whereas Goliath had weapons of this world. I, I, need, to, I need to teach on spiritual warfare again real soon. I, I recognize that. I, I don't want to because every time I do, uh, the devil just beats on us. It's just part of it. If we open up that can, it's like, oh, no, it's hard to get that genie back in the bottle, you know? But the reality is, I believe the modern church is functioning by and large without any regard to the spiritual dimension, the warfare that's raging right now. Look to your left and your right. Look to your left and your right. There's somebody right around you that's in the biggest spiritual war of their lives and most of them are oblivious to it. Literally their souls are at stake today and most of them have no concept of that. They just are sort of here drifting through another Sunday and they have no clue that today they may have to give an account for their very life before a holy God. That's not the codeine speaking. It's the truth, folks. It's the truth. We need to get God's perspective in this thing. The reason the giants are kicking our tail is that we don't see with spiritual light. Number three, we must look for what God sees. We must begin to look for what God sees. Think about that for just a moment. In verse 26, back up in the chapter. We didn't read it, but it's on, it's on the screen. I wanted you to be able to see it. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him saying, um, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For, um, excuse me, but, but who is this uncircumcised Philistine that, that he should taunt the armies of the living God? David was looking at it from God's perspective. And David, David understood that this dude was offending God. You don't offend God and get away with it. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. I don't 
care who you are. I don't care how smart you are. You don't offend God and get away with it. And your best route is to run to the mercy of the cross immediately once you've offended God. Because he's always there waiting to forgive you. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done. And David's looking at this and saying, um, does this uncircumcised Philistine think he's going to get away with this? And you know what he's saying? Who's going to go cut his head off? I mean, that's really what he's saying. Who's going to go cut his head off? Because you don't just say stuff like that to God. You don't do stuff like that. I mean, it's going down, folks. Sooner or later. It's going... Are you listening to me? Excuse me, I just blew a bubble. I think that's a first. On the platform, anyway. I'm trying. All right, that's, I'm better. You okay? Do you even remember what I said before that? So we must, bubble, yeah, I got that. We must look for what God sees. We must look for what God sees. Get this, the men of Israel saw size, strength, and the armor of, uh, of Goliath. But David saw a man who was not cut. Ethan, did you catch what I just did there? Did you catch that? That's pretty good, wasn't it? Okay. I don't mean cut as in ripped, like me. Okay, maybe that is the codeine speaking there. So, David saw a man who was not cut. Goliath was not circumcised. Goliath had not been to the doctor. Why? Because Goliath was not part of that ratified covenant under God and with God. Goliath did not have the protection and the power of God. And Goliath was trying to stand against not the Israelites. Listen. But Goliath was trying to stand against God. He didn't know it yet. He didn't understand that. But that's exactly what he was doing. David saw a man who was not cut. He didn't have the marking of God. So he didn't have the power of God. He didn't have the promises of God. He was not circumcised. And from the Israelites' perspective, they focused on Goliath's physical stature. David's perspective focused on the power of God. What, what are you looking at? What are your eyes on? Listen, it's not just what you see, but how you view what you see. Did you get that? It's not just what you see, but how you view what you see. The armies of Israel were looking at the same things that David was. But David saw it differently. Those giants, everybody that sees those giants, they see the same thing that you see. But they're looking at it differently. When we learn to look at it from God's perspective, that's the game changer. That's, that's when we really... That's when we really begin to move forward in the right direction with God. That's when we take that diamond that is God, that army, that power of the host. We take that power and we begin to implement it in our lives. And we recognize, you know what, why would I be intimidated by these giants? These giants don't have power and authority over me. It may feel like it at the moment. There may be a season where I'm intimidated. But I... I have access to Yahweh Savah. Number four, David saw the spiritual reality behind the social problem. David saw the spiritual reality behind the social problem. There was a social problem. There was some bullying going on. Was there not? I mean, I think that's some pretty powerful bullying, actually. But David was able to look beyond the social problem. He was able to look and see the spiritual reality in the midst of it. And we do that in our culture. We, we're living in a, a time in history where everybody's really concerned about social things uh, until next week. 
And then we've kind of forgotten it and we're waiting for the next big thing. Right? Oh, come on. You know it's true. But David saw there was something deeper going on. We've got to be able to look past that. We've got to have that kind of perspective. This is about a paralyzed people who are facing ultimate bullying. But David told Goliath that he had offended the Lord of hosts and that the Lord would kill him. And David had confidence because he knew the power of God's name. Second thing you need to do. You ready? Now remember, that was one thing, kind of some principles of how you get there, changing your perspective. Second thing, give your giants to God. Amen. Give your giants to God. David did that. How do you do it? Practical, number one, understand God is supreme over the situation. Understand that God is supreme over the situation. Where do I see that in Scripture? David informed Goliath that the Lord would deliver him into his hands. David did not inform Goliath that David would deliver Goliath. David informed Goliath that the Lord would deliver him into his hands. Verse 46, we already read this, but look at it one more time. This day, the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. That's pretty strong talk, folks. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Number two, I got to get through this quickly. Don't abdicate your personal responsibility. Don't give up on your personal responsibility is what I'm trying to say. What does that look like? Well, you know, David, you know the story, David, uh, Saul tried to get David to put on his armor and I can just imagine this huge piece of armor trying to be placed on this little shepherd boy at this time. Most people believe David was somewhere between 13 and 16 or something like that. And he's trying to put on this full armor and, and go out and battle. He couldn't function in it. He said, I haven't tested it. I haven't worked in this. I, I'm not accustomed to it. David didn't try to do it somebody else's way. Listen, nothing wrong with Saul's armor. Say that. Nothing wrong with Saul's armor. Okay? Does not mean that Saul's armor was bad. We live in a time again in a history where we're looking at what a, somebody else is doing and what somebody else is using. And if we don't like it, we say it's bad. There was nothing wrong with Saul's armor. It just was not what God wanted David to wear that day. That's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. And so David, listen, he didn't give up his responsibility. David chose to pick up stones, right? He goes out. How many stones did he get? Five stones. Did he think he was going to miss four times? No. Some have suggested that, uh, that Goliath had four brothers. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> David goes out, he gets the, the stones. He puts them in his pouch. He's got his sling that he was very accustomed to. But he did his part. He didn't just say, okay, God. Now, there are times in Scripture where God says, shut your mouth, be still, and watch the salvation of the Lord. The problem is... A lot of you have been waiting for God to take down your giant for 30 years. And God's been waiting for you to pick up your stones. You listening? But you're watching the Israelites and the great armies and all the other churches and all the other ministries and all the other families and all the other events. And you're saying, well, we don't have all that. And God is saying, pick up your stones. Pick up what you have. Stand your ground and watch God do something amazing. You see, giants, look at this on the screen, have a way of intimidating you at such a deep level that you end up doing nothing. Is that true? I really do think that's the way most believers deal with giants today. We're so intimidated that we, we end up doing nothing. Well, this must be my thorn in the flesh. This must be what God has planned for my life. This just must be the way he wants me to live. Oh, me. Third and last thing. Don't take credit 
for what God is doing. Amen. Don't take credit. We live in the world where uh, everybody's ready to tweet out their most brilliant statement that they just thought of 30 minutes ago or 30 seconds ago, excuse me. Everybody wants to be recognized. Everybody wants to be seen in a created reality that they've created. And yet David was very, very careful not to take credit for what God had done. There was a humility about David. Oh, David would do some dumb things later in his life, and he certainly would sin greatly against God. But there's something amazing about his heart, certainly at this point in his life. In verse 47, look at this and we're done. He said, And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Yahweh. Savah. Don't take credit for what God is doing. Give your giants to God. Give your giants to God. I don't think there was any point where David in his young, impetuous, arrogant, young mind thought, I'm going to go take down this giant. Everything that we see in this passage was David pointing to the God of all creation was David pointing to Yahweh Savah and David had unwrapped that name of God to the extent that he had absolute total complete confidence that the God the warrior God could take care of this man that most saw as a giant What's your giant today? What's the giant that's causing you so much trouble? Maybe there's 10 of them in your life. Maybe there's 30, I don't know. But what are those giants that you've just sort of decided, I, I, I just, I, I, I can't do this. Praise the Lord if that's what you're saying, because you can. But will you unwrap, unwrap this amazing God Will you allow him to work in you personally? Will you give your giant to him? Will you view these giants through his lens, his perspective, and quit telling God what he can't do in your life? That's the Yahweh Savah that offers you amazing power today. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus the name that allows us to approach you the name that has bought our freedom through your blood and Lord we claim today together as a faith family we claim the power that is still active today of the warrior God the Lord of hosts that has all the resource, all the power, all the authority that we need to take down the giants in our lives. And God, today, we want to see those giants through your perspective as simply obstacles that have no authority and no power over us. And God, we want to change the way we see things. And God, we want to, certainly God, we want to trust you in these moments. Scott, even this morning as we've prayed about these giants, I pray today we see them totally different than we did an hour ago. And thank you, Lord, for your provision. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.